and welcome on in to episode three of Eagles Memories, part of the Eagles Pin Poll Network. I am your host, John Stolness. You read my work in BleedingGreenNation.com. And of course, you also know me as the host of the Eye on the Enemy podcast. And we will get into those Eye on the Enemy podcasts as we get closer to training camp. But here during the summer slow period in the NFL, we are taking a look back at the 2004 Eagles season 20 years later. Yes, that's right. For those of you who want to feel really old and you remember that 2004 season, it has been two full decades, 20 years since that great Eagles team made that run to the Super Bowl. And in episodes one and two, uh, we took a look back at the summer of T.O., that incredible offseason where we got so hyped up after the Eagles went out and signed, traded for Terrell Owens and signed him to that contract. All the drama involved with the Baltimore Ravens and the 49ers and everything else that went down. And then we took a look last week at the first four games of the regular season and uh, a peek at that preseason game against the Ravens that got that got everybody so hopped up. So a lot of fun on those first two episodes. If you haven't heard them yet, you can listen to them anytime you want. They are good for all seasons. And here in episode three, I am very excited to talk to one of the architects of that team, one of the guys who put those teams together along with Andy Reid and, of course, uh, team owner Jeffrey Lurie. And that, of course, is former Eagles president Joe Banner. He was the president of this team from 1995 to 2012 uh, was uh, one of the uh, one of the guys who authored Probably one of the the greatest stretch of Eagles football from from start to finish uh, from the time Jeffrey Lurie took over until he left in 2012. So uh, he's going to join me to talk about his memories of this 2004 Eagles season. Joe Banner, thank you so much for joining me here on Eagles Memories. How are you, sir? I'm good, John. I enjoy being with you. Looking forward to the conversation. This should be a lot of fun, and I've had a great time going through. Uh, I, I mean, I was uh, in my early 20s when this 2004 season happened. I think I went to more Eagles games that year than I have than I had gone to in any other season. Just the excitement that the fan base had going into that 2004 season I, was really unparalleled. And I, I guess to start off, as you kind of look back on it 20 years later, what, what, is you, what is your most vivid memory of that 2004 season? Like, is there a single moment that sticks out to you from that? season that you look back on and you think, wow, that was amazing? Um, frankly, too many to just answer with one. But, uh, <laughs> you know, the highlights really started in the off season. I mean, people kind of forget, but the signing of Curse, the trade for mm-hmm. Terrell Owens, obviously those – Terrell has kind of dominated the visibility of that, but we, we viewed those both as kind of crucial attempts to be a little more short-term thinking and try to get over the top and – and from that point forward, just the excitement in the city, the fans, when we got to training camp, I vividly remember just training camp was always really intense and passionate and crowded. But it was just different that year, that the level of excitement and belief and kind of trust and, you know, anticipating what was coming. And then, you know, as we went through the season, it was just, uh, you know, from the first play of the first game all the way through to the last game, it was just like, wow, this is just such an incredible ride. Sadly, it ended without us winning the Super Bowl, which is still cre- incredibly painful for me. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, well, for us the, too. <laughs> yeah, but the ride until we got to that that game um, was just one joy and and one thrill and one incredible ride of energy mm-hmm. uh, that I could ever imagine experiencing. I spent the first episode chronicling and detailing the acquisition of Terrell Owens. And I agree with you, the Javon Kerr signing was also a, a huge signing for this team. He was a, he was a guy who's a, a sack monster, obviously the freak. We all know what he could do. And uh, he had a couple of pretty good seasons uh, with the Eagles. But Terrell Owens, obviously... The entire fan base saw was the difference maker heading into 2004. And for, for a lot of folks in the fan base, myself included, and I'm sure you remember this was, a am sure, a regular conversation on WIP at the time, was that the team needed a guy like Terrell Owens. They needed a number one wide receiver for the years leading up to that. It was really the first time Donovan McNabb had had a true number one wide receiver, a guy who you could just really have a matchup advantage against everyone. And understanding, of course, those guys do not grow on trees. There's a reason Terrell Owens was was Terrell Owens. But were there opportunities in the years leading up to 2004, 2002, 2003 specifically when It seemed like you guys were knew that you were going to be one of the top contenders in the NFC. You guys were Super Bowl contenders, NFC championship game contenders. And it it felt to the fan base like there was a a weakness there at at wide receiver that the team didn't address. What was your game plan going into those seasons and how did it change going into 2004? 
Well, I don't remember any opportunities to trade for somebody at that position that could have the kind of impact that uh, we thought T.O. could. Uh, I'm sure there were players in the draft because, you know, as we were then and as they are to this day, you know, prioritizing, you know, dominating the line of scrimmage, mm-hmm. stuff like that, um, as opposed to prioritizing, which, you know, frankly, is not unusual. Almost every fan base in the country is infatuated and excited by wide receivers. <laughs> it was kind of ironic in Philadelphia because we were getting criticized for passing too much and then getting criticized for not having, you know, good enough wide receivers, which was it felt, it felt close, like an <laughs> ironic kind of contradiction. Yeah, sure, uh, sure. But uh, no, we, T. D. Hill was the first time where we had a, an opportunity to acquire somebody that was a proven talent at that position. Um, and if you've recounted it, and my memory may not be even as good as whatever you went through, but he was literally had agreed to a trade to the Ravens, mm-hmm. um, and and it was really kind of done. And frankly, yeah. we hadn't gotten that much of a chance to engage before that kind of yeah. all seemed to be gotten uh, and happened. And so the first thing, and, and you know, trades were a big part of you know my responsibility. And that so the first thing I really had to do was try to convince them to not go through. Uh, with the trade to the Ravens. And in fact, you know, we worked together um, to kind of convince the Ravens that they'd be better off, you know, without him. And, you know, that, you know, he could be a little disruptive. I'm not getting into a debate with T.O., but that was the argument sure. we used in part with the Ravens in cooperation with T.O. to try to get him to Philly, which I think he mainly preferred, which is ironic because we had a better quarterback situation, mm-hmm. which is obviously to a wide receiver is key. Uh, and once we got to that point, we were actually able to agree fairly quickly with a trade with the 49ers and still proud of what I feel was a very, very strong trade for us giving up, you know, really not that much for, for yeah. what we were getting back. Uh, and then obviously in the end, we negotiated the contract, not anticipating the challenge that was going to become. But at the time, obviously something that, you know, while he could have stayed in San Francisco and could have gone to Baltimore, you know, was something that did pay him and as one of the top couple wide receivers in football, at least at the time that it was signed. So, you know, I, it was kind of a complex series of steps, and it was unusual that you had to go through a first step of even create him where it was back that he was at least available, which at one moment he was, and then mm. before we got a chance to really engage, he wasn't. Yeah, I mean, I remember, and, and one of the things I talked about on the podcast was it, really they made a paperwork mistake that screwed up his free agency. He really should have been a free agent going into that off season, and that was the argument they made to the special master that it certainly looked like the special master involved was going to rule that Terrell Owens would become a free agent. And so both it seemed like the Ravens and, and the Forty uh, Nine ers said, "Well, let's get something out of this since it doesn't look like this is going to go in our direction." And so I guess the you kind of indicated the level of surprise that you actually ended up with Terrell Owens was pretty high, right? Yeah, I mean, at various points. I mean, when we first talked about internally, we thought we had a really good chance to get him. And as you mentioned, there was the controversy with the contract. And then we were a little more worried. But we still read it that we thought he was going to become free. But then while we were kind of planning our strategy and maybe feeling out the opportunity, they went ahead and kind of made this deal with Baltimore, which I think was exactly what you said. Like, we're not going to be able to keep this guy. We better make sure we at least don't walk away with this with nothing. Uh, and then, you know, through our efforts, in part, you know, he became back available. But it was a roller coaster ride, to be sure. It wasn't like just grabbing a free agent, agreeing on a contract, and you had him. There were a number of yeah. steps. And at some points, we were very optimistic. At some point, we'd virtually given up. Owens obviously had all the talent in the world. You could see it when he was with the 49ers. He was on a Hall of Fame track. And, and it's he's a perfect fit in pretty much any offense that you have. So uh, it seemed as though the fit on the field was obvious to everyone, obvious to Terrell Owens as well. And, and we were all excited as a fan base to see how Donovan McNabb would do with a player like Terrell Owens on the outside. And it also bumps down the other receivers a little bit to a, a role that's probably more suited to them. Todd Pinkston and Freddie Mitchell fit into their roles really well with Terrell Owens as kind of the alpha dog in that offense. But you mentioned that you had been having conversations with the Ravens, essentially saying, you know, hey, maybe, you know, Owens can be kind of a headache. And if he doesn't want to play for you, that could be an issue for you. But how concerned were you about Terrell Owens' makeup off the field? Some of the stuff that he did with standing on the star and kind of creating a a brouhaha with the Cowboys in that game in Dallas. Were you, what was, I mean, obviously you felt it was worth the risk, but how big a concern did you guys have? How much did you all talk about the off the field stuff with Terrell Owens, the attitude? Yeah, we did talk about it a lot, to be honest. I mean, I think we had grown comfortable with it or we wouldn't have proceeded with the trade, but obviously, and this is not unique to that deal. We sat down and 
what are the pluses, what are the minuses, you know, where do we come out, you know, kind of what are we willing to pay, what are we willing to trade, whatever it was at acquiring a play. We always had that kind of conversation. You know, and remember, uh, you know, Andy had relationships with the 49ers. He had a relationship with Steve Young um, and some other players that had played with Terrell. So we felt like we had done a lot of research on, you know, what was real versus what was uh, being portrayed or the way the, the media had made it look. And, you know, T.O. himself was very vocal of feeling like he had never been portrayed fairly. So we did a lot of research to see, was there a little merit in that? Was there a lot of merit in that? And obviously, in the end, we decided that the, uh, the benefits outweighed, you know, whatever negatives there were or potentially there were. Um, you know, and I think in that 2004 season, obviously, we all wished it had gone on even longer, um, <laughs> you know, that he proved that that was true. Although, you know, again, we skipped over Hurst quickly, it hurts quickly, but you can see the way the team is built to this day. I mean, we really thought that if we mm-hmm. could add someone like him to dominate the defensive line, um, I think even after we went to the Super Bowl, there was some of the building that still thought Curse was the most important acquisition we'd made that off season, and some thought it was terrible. But it was at least a debate, you know, a, a healthy, positive debate because we <laughs> comparing two guys we acquired that we felt really good about and had led to the best season we'd had to that point. Um, but you know, that was a lot easier because we could just call the agent and do a deal. Uh, right. But we did go through all the pluses and minuses, and, and we really felt like with Andy's leadership, the strength of the team, the leaders we had on the team, the Dawkinses and the Trotters, McNabs, etc., John Runyons, uh, that we created an environment that gave him a really good chance uh, to succeed. It reminded me a little of the discussion last year when Eagles drafted Carter, and they yeah. felt that the people they had on the team, the quality of the leadership, the culture they divided gave them a chance where other teams were passing on a player that everybody knew was really talented. That was a little bit how we felt about it. We had strong coach leadership. Uh, we had a quarterback that wanted that, that type of weapon. We had great leaders on the team. So we thought we gave him this environment, gave him the best chance to succeed and prove that his uh, complaints about how he was being portrayed were valid. So you go and get Terrell Owens, you, you sign Javon Curse, and, and it seems as though now the, the team is really making a, a push to get over the hump. And you mentioned, you know, the hump is real. There's those three straight NFC championship games that just failed to break through, couldn't get past uh, couldn't, couldn't get past that, that round to get to your second Super Bowl. How much pressure were you all under to finally break through? And how much did that impact going out and signing a guy like Javon Curse and, and trading for Terrell? Owens would you have made those moves had you had won one of those NFC championship games do you think I think the answer is yes but we'll never know Um, (laughs) I mean the pressure was internal I mean you know everything was sold we could sell we led the league in sponsorships and games was sold out etc etc but I think we were a little bit like the fans I mean the first time we went to the championship game and lost it was very disappointing but there was also some gratification getting to that point right by the second time it was pain by the third time, it was torture. <laughs> and, you know, we were living with it every minute of every day. Um, yeah. So it was, you know, it was us just saying, you know, we got to we got to do anything we possibly can, even if it means some long term sacrifices. And we'd always manage the team with a vision of the next two to three years. Mm-hmm. And that year we really said, you know what, we're not going to completely blow up two to three years, but let's just right. focus on doing everything we can to win it this year. So it did create a sense of urgency. Um, there was pressure, but for us, it was more about just relieving the agony of getting so close and not getting there <laughs> yeah. uh, than it was a business decision or, or even, you know, demanding the fans. I mean, we wanted them right. to be excited. We wanted them to be satisfied. We appreciated their support. But we were also tortured ourselves over the mm-hmm. three close calls. And I think that drove it more than anything. I don't know if that helps Eagles fans feel better to know that you were as tortured as we were, but I'll take it. And it's fu- it's funny, like that Buccaneers loss. I mean, that uh, that Tampa Bay loss. Uh, the sorry, the Rams loss on the road in two thousand one. I mean, you're going against the greatest show on turf on the road as the underdog. That's yeah. an NFC Championship game loss where it, it feels almost hopeful. Like, okay, we we're building something here. And then in two thousand two, I was at that game against Tampa, and it was it was a shocked silence and so you didn't the anger didn't set in it was more like i can't believe that happened the game against the panthers is where the anger and the panic really did start to set in among the fan base and so it i think was gratifying to the fans to see the the front office to see you guys go out and make a play for terrell owens and make a play for javon curse and actually and actually land those two guys and so as you go through the summer you start the season and obviously the team gets off to a red hot start they go on a rampage 
at one point in the season, and my guess is it was pretty early because it, was, it seemed pretty early to the rest of us. At what point did you guys realize we're pace setting the NFC? Like th- we're this is as good a team as we can put on the field right now, and and this really there really should be no obstacle between us and getting to the Super Bowl. Yeah, I mean, maybe we were arrogant, but honestly, from the time we made those acquisitions, when we already thought we had a very good team, but realized we needed a little bit more to get all the way to where we were trying to get, um, we were just extremely confident. We were scared to death of injuries, um, and obviously we had some, yeah. including Terrell late in the season. Um, but we really felt like, you know, if this doesn't do it, I don't even know what could, was kind of our, you know, mindset about the thing. So we were very confident. The team was really confident. Um, and I don't remember at any point feeling like that wavered at all. Um, you know, we'd lose a game and, you know, your emotions go down a little bit when that happens. And it's natural to kind of look at, you know, you know, why did that happen? Do we have a weakness we didn't re- realize? You're asking yourself those kind of questions. But we pretty much stayed on a real high with a very high expectation. And we thought we would win the Super Bowl. We didn't just think we'd get in it. Uh, we really thought we'd built the best team in the league. And, you know, we know enough to know that. You know, one bad call by a referee, one bad bounce, a follow at the wrong moment, an injury. There are so many things, even if you have the best team, that can keep you from winning the championship. We were worried about those kinds of things. But we really felt like we built the best team and we had as good a coaching staff as anybody in the league. So those are usually the two things that get you over the top. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. What were the first signs of cracks between Owens and McNabb? Did it happen early in the season? Did it happen late in the season? I've seen some different things out there in terms of when people think it might have started. But did you get a sense as to when you realized, you know, hey, you know, we need to repair something or something's not quite right here? Yeah, I mean, I didn't feel like there was a moment. But even in the first year, you did kind of observe some things that made you wonder if the relationship was going to stay strong or kind of how long would this work for they weren't major things you know we weren't sitting there thinking oh my god i wonder if we made a mistake that kind of things but there were some subtle things that did have you um, wondering a little bit if it would work kind of long term Um, and that was really the key we always felt like if the team was winning and donovan and to were getting along well that at least that part of things you know would would work and last you know for a sustained sustained period of time but you could see some little tensions, some minor things, probably if you weren't watching closely, you could even easily miss um, that made, you know, at least I was starting to wonder whether this was really going to work long term. Although I was so committed in my own head to just enjoying the season, we'd worked so hard, um, even with the success we'd had, we had a lot of frustration. And I was just committed to kind of like being in the moment and enjoying it and, you know, hopefully walking out of it and finally being able to take that trophy from the commissioner. Yeah, and it was really a disappointment because I, I, before we get to the Super Bowl, let me take it to that NFC Championship game because I, I guess I in the fan in, in the in the stadium it was I was there in 2002 against the Buccaneers and then I was there in 2004 against the Falcons and I don't know what the rest of the fan base was feeling at that time but for you was it more a sense of relief? Uh, joy. I mean, there's a combination of all these different kinds of things, but I got I got to believe that relief was among the most prevalent emotions that you were feeling when you finally walked off the field, knowing you'd beaten the Falcons 27 to 10. It was a solid victory, and you're going on to the World Series after coming up short all those different years. Yeah, I mean, it was both a relief, uh, but it was also a real you know the job's not done feeling. Yeah. I mean, it was got two more weeks. You know, there was it was just a, a feeling of like a high that you couldn't get away from. But at the same time, you wanted to be really focused and, and work hard and realize that, you know, if we just get to the Super Bowl instead of the championship game, yeah, it's another step forward. But that really is not going to relieve kind of the pressure that we felt and frustration we felt that we'd gotten so close but hadn't made it. So it was both. It was definitely a sense of relief that we were finally at least going to the Super Bowl. We were going to experience that. We had a real chance to win the trophy. But there was also a definite, and I think this was everybody there. I don't think I'm just speaking myself. You know, the job is not done. If we don't mm-hmm. get this one more win, 
then yeah, it's better than last year, but it's still, we just didn't get to feel that we'd imagine the trip, the uh, parade, you know, holding mm-hmm. the trophy, you know, flying back on the plane after you've won the Super Bowl. What would all those things feel about? We were finally had a chance that we we're actually going to really finally right. feel it, just not dream it. And uh, so we felt both. There's no doubt there was a sense of relief, but it wasn't like a finished. Ah, good. Yeah. We finished the job. Now we got to the Super Bowl. Yeah, I think basically it staved off disaster uh, was was part was part of it because they really do wonder, man, had they had, had you all not won in 2004, what happens? You know, and then in the in the multiverse of possibilities that no one likes to think about and everyone is glad didn't happen. I can't imagine what the fallout would have been uh, from that. Do you, I'll ask you, what do you think the fallout would have been? Do you do you ever think about that? Like if you'd lost, like what what could have happened? I mean, I, mean, I, would, I would imagine you maybe had some plans in place. Should that have have gone down that way? Uh, honestly, we really didn't. Um, okay. I mean, I think we obviously would have taken a lot of heat and a lot of criticism. Um, but I don't know that it wasn't like we were going to make a coaching change. We mm-hmm. preferred to have T.O. come back, so that certainly wasn't in the cards. Much of the roster was under contract for another year, so we had an opportunity for continuity if we wanted that. Um, I don't know. We obviously would have gone back and studied everything together and really tried to figure out, like, all right, so we got better, but we're still not there. What what could we do to push it over the top? It may have been a different signing, another trip. But I don't think it would have been anything major. Like we weren't sitting there talking about major contributors that maybe wouldn't be part of the future anymore. We certainly weren't considering at that point any kind of a coaching change or mm. even within the staff type changes. So we would have taken a lot of heat. People would have been really upset and disappointed, but I'm not sure that the team would have changed that much before the 2005 season. Let's talk about that Super Bowl because it was certainly a, a nip and tuck game. The Eagles really dominated play in the first half, but uh, just weren't able to, to put the Patriots away. Donovan McNabb had a couple of big turnovers in that game. Terrell Owens, of course, comes back, makes a miraculous recovery and plays exceedingly well on clearly a leg that wasn't 100 percent in that game. What, in your mind, was the biggest reason why you guys were not able to beat the Patriots? Because it, just, it didn't seem like the Patriots played all that well in the first half, and then suddenly they had all the answers in the second half of that game. And I know there are conspiracy theorists out there who will, who will tell you maybe they had some of the answers written, in the, written on the back of their hands. But in your mind, as you look back on that Super Bowl, what's the biggest reason why you guys think you weren't able to win that game? You know, again, I don't know that there's a reason. I mean, you're right. We got off to a strong start. We were dominating the game. Um, the Patriots had some success, uh, and then somehow that feel that the floodgates opened. They scored, I think, three touchdowns in a row. Yeah, we had a seven nothing lead, um, and suddenly it felt like our defense was, you know, on their heels. Obviously, the turnovers didn't help. It's really hard to win a Super Bowl and have those kind of turnovers. Um, no disrespect to T.O. or anybody, I do think that uh, and when I had the opportunity to work at ESPN for a couple of years, Teddy Bruschi was there. We got to talk a little bit about the game. Um, I asked him the question, you know, Bill Belichick was famous for kind of taking out your best offensive weapon out of the game and then forcing you to make other things happen. Um, it was interesting to me that they, in that game, their strategy was to try to take Westbrook out of the game mm-hmm. and realized that they probably couldn't shut T.O. down, but if they could shut down Westbrook and the other uh, West opportunities, weapons that we had, that even if T.O. had a good game, that they, we probably wouldn't score a ton of points. I think in hindsight that turned out to be smart and true, and some of those turnovers did come on plays where we were trying to get the ball to Westbrook. Mm. Um, but I think if we had maybe had a more diverse offense, we would have scored a, a few more points. And I think defensively, I don't think we did something wrong, but maybe we could have been a little bit more aggressive. You know, we had built that defense with Jim Johnson on being very aggressive and attacking. There were some things about Brady and the way the Patriots played that we decided to be moderately aggressive, but not kind of all-out attacking. You know, that made sense at the time, but in hindsight, you know, I wonder, you know, because our personality was really to be more aggressive, that wouldn't have made a difference. But these are just 2020 hindsight type suggestions yeah. at the time. It seemed like we were doing things that made sense and was smart. Just came up a little short, you know, a couple of key plays, as we always feared, you know, can get that close and then that's the difference.
I, I do need to ask you about that that last drive, uh, the Greg Lewis touchdown drive that just seemed to be going in slow motion. And I know Eagles fans were were going out of their minds watching it all kind of go slowly, 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 not not wishing that the team would, would move a little bit faster. Were you feeling the same thing in the moment? And did you ever get a sense as to as to why things weren't moving a little bit more quickly in that last drive? Not that it would have necessarily meant they win, but maybe have given you a better shot to get one final possession. Yeah, uh, for for sure, feeling the same way. You know, how could you not? Um, yeah. You know, I mean, there's a balance between wanting to be smart, go in a huddle, increase your chance of scoring, but also remembering, you know, we got to get two scores before the end of this game to uh, make a comeback. Um, I mean, I do think there was some degree, which has been talked about, of, of exhaustion um, that, you know, kept us from maybe going to quite the faster pace all the way all in on the faster pace that we probably needed to. Um, but again, we were trying to find the balance there between making sure we were doing what we needed to, getting everybody clear on the play call, making sure we at least scored one touchdown and then trying to get the second one. Um, again, I think something in hindsight, everybody would agree we, we should have even been more aggressive and faster. I think everybody's mm-hmm. feeling that in the moment. That's not really hindsight. Um, but it's what ended up happening, and you know we did get the ball back, but not with enough time, with any realistic hope of doing anything. Now, obviously, the off season after the 2004 season, as part of this podcast, we'll we'll do a postscript and and kind of recount kind of how it all fell apart in in 2005. But obviously, it centers around Terrell Owens and and the contract, and uh, and certainly seemingly uh, some of the issues that he had with with Donovan McNabb the season before. If you could go back and do anything differently. With regards to that offseason, with regards to Owen's contract, trying to keep that group together uh, and get another couple of cracks at it with Owens and McNabb on the same team, would you do anything differently? Would you and Mr. Lurie have done anything differently in order to try and keep Owens in the fold and, and, and keep things together? Or was it kind of an inevitability given how T.O. was conducting himself? I mean, that's a hard question to answer. I mean, I'll... I'll probably anger a lot of people by saying, you know, on the headline stuff, no. <laughs> I mean, you know, we signed him to a contract that uh, I believe made him the second paced hard receiver at the time. If somebody looked it up and it was the third or the fourth or the first, I wouldn't be shocked. But it was somewhere in that ballpark. Okay. And I remember that uh, I think the deal averaged seven and a half million dollars a year, which is funny as we watched Jefferson sign for thirty five million dollars a year now. But at that time, that was, you know, the top of the market for wide receiver. And because we had a lot of cap room, we did the deal slightly different than most deals. At that time, they were still doing deals with big signing bonuses, small salary mm-hmm. usually for year one, and then a more modest salary for year two. And then, you know, the deals after that usually had about whatever the average of the deal was. So if I remember right, his salary in the first year was either 11 or 12 million bucks. And then year two, it was only like three and a half or four, which meant that he was making like 15 or 16 million dollars, seven and a half or eight million dollars average over the first two years of the deal. Um, which, again, at that time made him, you know, in that top of, couple of top paid wide receivers in the league. Um, so our view was, you know, paying him 11 or 12 for one year was way over market. It was what we agreed to and he agreed to. So the salary in year two was lower. And then the salaries after that were, you know, pretty much what the average of the deal was. Um, to this day, you know, 20 years later, no one has signed a star player to a five, six, seven year contract and then done it over again after one year. But that right. isn't really the most important thing to me. It was we truly gave him an average that compensated him as one of the top players in the league. If you looked at what he was supposed to make with us over, say, the next three years and what he then signed with for Dallas, it was almost the same amount of money. Hmm. So I don't know how much it was really about the money. And if we had changed the money, probably would have at least kept him. But I don't know because obviously there were other issues going on between him and Donovan and him and, frankly, yeah. some of the other teammates. So. I don't know if we had just fixed the money, if it would have mattered. And as I say, to this day, I don't care. You could be, you know, the quarterback that made the MVP. People just don't, after one year, when you're already paying a guy the average of the top players in the league. Um, so no no insult yeah. to him. He was, you could tell from the first practice he ever attended, no pads, nothing. You automatic already were going, wow. I mean, as good yeah. as we thought this guy was, he's obviously even better seeing him in person. Um but I think we felt like we had been fair with him. I think the fact that he then went on to sign with the Cowboys for a bit more money. But if you looked over, you know, I think he signed a three-year deal with them. It was for a bit more, but it was in the same ballpark of what we owed him. Um, and the, as we said, both really alluded to, there were other factors there that maybe even if the contract part had been 
satisfied were challenges that could have affected the 2000 season, certainly mm-hmm. 2005 season, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Disappointing finish to that to that era. What could have been. But, uh, you know. Again, alternate universes and whatnot. Before I let you go, I do want to ask you just a question or two about the 2024 Eagles here. Uh, we're about to hit the summer part of the NFL calendar where there's not a lot that's going to be happening until training camp rolls around. They've got all their draft picks in here. They've made all of the major moves that they're going to make, and pretty much everybody around the NFL has. As you look at this 24 team, I think a lot of it is going to be centered around what Jalen Hurts does. Is he more like his 2022 version or the 2023 version, which was a good player last year, but certainly not at the level he was the year before? What kind of Jalen Hurts do you think we're going to see here in 2024, closer to 22 or last year? You know, I don't know that Jalen Hurts will change that much, but I know Kellen Moore well, uh, and I've watched him over the years, and I have a very high opinion of him. And I think that whatever there is that can take best advantage of Kellen's strengths, I mean, uh, Jalen's strengths and weaknesses, uh, you will get Kellen to look at it that way, be objective, not just be stuck on how he's always done things and, and create an offense to give you a sh- chance to do that. I do worry a little bit, you know, as you can see from way back when I was there and, and now that belief in the offensive line, you know, I, I worry yeah. about the Kelsey retirement, you know, a center that, uh, I think looks like he should be able to move over and do well, but we have to see him do that. And I think one of the underestimated values of Kelsey was how much he helped the quarterback by helping the offensive line, make sure they were in the right situation. Everybody knew what they were supposed to do on the play. Um, So I worry a little bit about that on the offensive side. Um, I mean, other than really young players, the defense is pretty similar to what was last year. I really like Nolan Smith in the draft, so I'll be really surprised if we don't see a lot more from him than what we saw last year. Um, I still really worry about the secondary quite a bit because they're really mm-hmm. counting on projections there. I mean, I, I like the Mitchell to, a lot in the draft. It was a little less high, but still positive on Cooper. Um, but those players, very few corners are really good in their first year. Yeah. Um, so I think one of them will probably start. The other will probably get a year to develop and get, you know, over time kind of rotated in. So I still worry a lot about the secondary. The defensive line is still very good, but not quite as as good as it was when it was dominant. So I think there's a lot of strengths, and I'm very hopeful about the season, but there's still a couple of spots I'd kind of like to see how they end up playing out. Yeah, I don't love uh, swapping out Hassan Reddick for Bryce Huff, although I'm hopeful Huff is an ascending player. But um, also, uh, do you like Vic Fangio's uh, defensive scheme, bringing him in as a defensive coordinator? I do, but, you know, I'm I'm as – our earlier conversation probably tipped you off. I really like a defense that's extremely yeah, aggressive. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, I just want to attack and you know mm-hmm. keep teams off balance. And you know even when you're not attacking, you know they have to worry about that because that's your personality. Um, yeah. So I think Vic's a very good coach. His career proves that. Um, I just I wonder in this era if it wouldn't be better to have somebody that was even more aggressive. But Vic's a very good coach and a huge upgrade, you know, from where we were a year ago. Um, and hopefully he'll be a little more aggressive with with him than they have been at some of his other spots. But he'll still be he'll still do a very very good job whether they add that wrinkle or not. Well, this has been a really fun conversation. I, I really appreciate you taking some time to talk about one of the most fun Eagle seasons I've ever been a part of, that 2004 Eagle season. It certainly is uh, It's one of those seasons that's etched. I can still remember every single game that season like it was yesterday. So uh, really fun to talk about it with you. Folks, uh, Joe Banner joining us here on Eagles Memories. Joe, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. A pleasure, John. Enjoyed it. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for this edition of Eagles Memories. And I just want to encourage everybody to tell friends about this pin poll network that we are getting started. We are trying to ramp it up so we have shows for you every day of the week, just like you used to get over at BGN Radio with the Bleeding Green Nation podcast feed. So uh, if you loved what we were doing over at the Bleeding Green Nation podcast feed and you are angry that that got ripped away from us and you know other people who are looking for a replacement for the Bleeding Green Nation podcast feed, make sure you send them on over here to the Pin Pull Network and subscribe to this network so you can get a ton of great Eagles content coming your way. We got a mix of the X's and O's. We'll have some regular, uh, regular folk 
podcasts here for you, guys like me who don't necessarily get a chance to to break down the film, but you want to talk about what's been going on, the latest trends, and we'll have uh, pre-games and post-game analysis and all that kind of stuff for you as the season rolls along. So get in on the ground floor right now here at the Eagles Pin Pool Network and tell friends and family members that we are here. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll do another Eagles Memories for you right here next week on this edition of Eagles Memories. Memories.